My name is Andreas Proksch and I'm trying to moderate you through the next one and a half hours. Let's see whether you help me and whether we manage to do it. I'm very glad to welcome all of you on our today's afternoon session, Raising Urban Mobility Ambition. That doesn't mean we want to raise the ambition for more urban mobility, but that means we want to raise the ambition that urban mobility contributes more to nationally determined contributions so that urban mobility can contribute to a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. With urban mobility, it's exactly the same as with football. Everyone is an expert. So everyone thinks he knows what the reasons are. Everyone has the best solutions. And like in football, normally it's the other cl club that wins. So normally our solutions don't really uh, work out at the end. So let's see what we can contribute today. The reason why we are meeting here is that we feel that urban mobility can contribute more to the nationally determined contributions. We feel the ambition is not high enough. We think there could be a higher contribution. And we would like to discuss so far with all of you what are the experiences from the different countries, what uh, good experience have been made. I always beg the people to talk about their failures as well because we can learn much more from failures than we can learn from uh, successful examples. Usually I'm not very successful with my pledges that we talk also about failure. Maybe today we can make also, we can talk also a little bit of what has not worked out. Uh, as I said, we want to raise awareness of the contribution of urban mobility to climate change mitigation for more ambitious NDCs and we think we need more action. We need more action in each and every city in Latin America. We need more ambition and we need more action at national level in all the countries of Latin America and maybe this will be one of the starting points to become to have a much clearer vision what could be done and what should be done. This event is organized by the SLOCAT uh, organization, the Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport, and also by GIZ, and I would very much like to thank Euroclima Plus for hosting us here today. They are very much involved in the subject, and so uh, it's good to be here together with friends and experts. We will draw on national experiences in Latin America. We will draw on the experiences of one city, some cities and we will, will also draw on some regional experiences uh, and then compare them what might work best. So far, so good. My next question or my next task was to announce Andrea Mesa, Director of Climate Change in Costa Rica. She's not yet here. That's okay. Uh, everyone has an extremely busy schedule, so we still expect her. And so we just uh, switch our plans. And I would like to start with Carl Pitt from SLOCAT. Very much welcome. Very good to have you here. You will talk about urban mobility in nationally determined contributions more as a fairly general um, yeah, just again, you'll get it. Um, a fairly general overview of what are the experiences in Latin America. And so we would need now the presentation of Carl Pett. And we also need a, a, a device to, to use it for the, for the PowerPoint to move it. And Carl, uh, you want to come already? Uh, well, we, oh yeah, okay. And is, yeah. You know how to use? Okay. Let me move that. 
Okay, volume is, is up. And um, thank you so much, Andreas, for that, uh, for that kind introduction. And thank you very much to your Klima, to, to GIZ, for this opportunity to speak on behalf of the SLOCAT partnership. Um, as noted, I'm Knowledge Director for the Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport, and what I would like to do with this brief presentation is to give an overview of, as you can see, mobility, how mobility is represented in the NDCs of the Latin American and Caribbean region, um, of course, with the existing NDCs that were submitted following the Paris Agreement in 2015, and really to give a bit of a really to set the stage a little bit for the, the country representatives to follow in this, in this event who will be looking toward the future. And so with this in mind, I would actually like to borrow the structure of the Talanoa dialogue and look at the, those three questions that were asked within the dialogue. Where are we? Where do we need to go? And how can we get ourselves there? So I'd like to start with the big picture. I think many of us are familiar with um, such projections, such curves, such trajectories, but, but what we see here really within the transport sector as kind of a microcosm for global GSG emissions on an economy-wide scale, we see here a tale of two trajectories. The blue band at the top of this graph um, represents a business-as-usual pathway for uh, emissions within the transport sector. So from the current levels of about eight gigatons of annual emissions from the transport sector and looking at a, a bottom-up modeling, we have the potential to go as uh, to more than double this amount. Um, so clearly not moving us in the right direction. We see as well this, um, this yellow, this gold band moving um, in a more optimistic direction. And this represents, again, a, a, a compilation of bot bottom-up modeling um, moving instead toward low carbon pathways and looking at mitigation potential of individual countries. And we can see at the more ambitious end of this very broad band, um, emissions levels approaching two to three gigatons annually from the transport sector that will allow, allow us to move in the direction of a 1.5 degree scenario or to actually achieve that to, for, for transport to make a proportional contribution within that scenario. And so we have here a very stark choice. We can either more than double our emissions or we can cut them by up to 80%. And again, we see that the mitigation, the good news here, the mitiga mitigation potential is there. These are, these are country studies as noted. Um, of course, this will require sufficient resources and sufficient political will in order to, to move in this direction. Also to, uh, again, putting this in that Talanoa dialogue question of, of where are we now, we can look at the way that transport is represented broadly in the NDCs submitted following or in the lead up to, to the Paris Agreement. And while we see that transport is, is identified by three quarters of NDCs as, a, as an important um, sector for reductions, this is, um, of course, very encouraging. We see very few countries that have, with, I should say within the regions, that have set specific targets and um, both qualitative and quantitative targets for actually achieving these reductions. And so as you see here, um, as you see by the map, actually it's hard to see some of the countries on the map because many of them are in the, um, the small island um, nations, but we see those, those countries the uh, vast majority, of course, looking at targeting transport as a mitigation source, many fewer looking at these direct and indirect targets, um, three in each category. And so, of course, um, targets are very essential to setting ambition and then, of course, um, achieving that through implementation, and I will return to this later in the presentation. Zooming in on the particular transport measures that are included within NDCs, we see well, a, a range of measures and also, I think, some kind of a skewing among these measures. So, in very broad terms, we can see within NDCs in the LAC region, um, much attention is paid to passenger transport. We see very rich um, measures on 
public transport, on e-mobility, um, uh, um, looking at rail infrastructure developments and others. At the same time, we see very few measures that are focused on uh, fuel economy standards, which include, um, I believe, Argentina and Uruguay and Venezuela. And, and we see really here no measures represented on walking and cycling on our more integrated land use policies. So there's a potential within these measures to increase the breadth of the measures and to, to balance them even better in order to reach those mitigation targets. Putting this in the avoid, shift, and improve framework, we also see a little bit of a lack of balance among the NDCs within the region. And so, as, as we like to think of avoid, shift, and, and improve a bit like reduce, reuse, and recycle, um, the, the priority is, is to avoid, and when we can't avoid, we shift, and when we can't shift, we improve. We see here perhaps this, this pyramid is a, a little bit turned upside down, and while we don't need to see a perfect balancing, or we shouldn't see necessarily a perfect balancing of these measures in order to achieve full mitigation potential, we see the potential to, to balance these perhaps better within the NDCs um, and, of course, the forthcoming NDC revisions. And as I've been focusing largely on mitigation ambition within NDCs, it's important also to note that um, adaptation within the transport sector is perhaps underrepresented in the NDCs of the region. Um, we see here, and, and also important to, to point out the, the vulnerability of many countries in the region, whether due to sea level rise or due to extreme heat, extreme preci precipitation and flooding that, of course, impacts transport infrastructure and services. So we see very important examples here of, of countries that are focused on protecting waterways that can be used for, for, um, for inland waterway transport and for international maritime transport as well, to include transport within vulnerability assessments and to, um, to really focus, of course, on the resiliency of infrastructure to include transport as well. Um, but at the same time, these examples are few, and so we see the potential for more attention in this area as well. So it's important when we talk very often about mitigation ambition that we also focus on adaptation. So the countries with uh, transport reduction targets, direct targets, um, we see here Dominica, Grenada, um, Trinidad, and Tobago. And um, again, we can see these quantified targets which can really help to achieve those those put those measures into place and we can see these against both an established baseline, for instance, the 2014 levels for Dominica or against a business as usual. And so, um, again, there is potential to in include more quantified targets and to do these in the most ambitious possible way, um, again, against an established baseline, ideally. We can also see examples of countries with indirect transport targets, so focus not on a quantified reduction of greenhouse gas um, emissions within the transport sector, but looking at uh, goals toward electric, um, more electric mobility, a reduction of conventional fuel use, and a reduction of black carbon, which in turn are proxies for GHG reductions, but also have the benefit of contributing toward sustainable development objectives as well. So these are very encouraging examples. And so looking to the third of those Talanoa Dialogue questions, where, where do we, or really how do we get there? Okay, there are different ways, of course, for NDCs to step up ambition. And so as, as GIZ has sketched out, we have the potential to, to really increase this ambition in a number of ways, to tighten existing targets within the, the given time frame, to set ambitious new targets, which could require as well adjusting timeframes for those targets. We can expand the scope of the targets to include other aspects of within the transport sector perhaps or to expand this scope to include other sectors as well. We can shift conditional targets to unconditional targets which in, in essence creates um, greater ambition and we can change the emphasis of existing targets as um, as a way to really step up ambition. And, and um, we as SLOCAT, the SLOCAT partnership are putting together a draft assessment framework for 
ambition, both ambition and action within NDCs, within forthcoming NDCs, to give a sense of how stated ambition and realized action stacks up against mitigation potential for a number of um, individual countries, of course, to include the Latin American Caribbean region. And we look forward to sharing the results of, of this study and this proposed framework early next year. So to summarize, um, to really step up transport um, or ambition on transport in the next generation of NDCs, we see the potential to set quantified greenhouse gas reduction targets and also to set those important indirect targets to achieve sustainable development objectives. We see the need to include measures on both transport mitigation and adaptation, um, of course, with resilient systems helping to um, really meet the mitigation potential on, on country levels and at local levels. And finally, the need to balance the proposed measures, both in terms of passenger and freight, in terms of avoid, shift, and improve, and other aspects. So um, I hope this can help, again, to set the stage, establish sort of a baseline for the country um, representatives and the other speakers to follow. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And um, we look forward to collaborating um, as we support the raising of uh, mitigation ambition and adaptation ambition in the forthcoming NDCs. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Carl. I think you have showed very clearly things are on the move, but not quick enough. There is time for higher ambition. Um, I guess Andrea Mesa, she just wrote that she would be about to come, has not yet come. So then we will just continue with uh, Michael Ingelskirchen from, from GIZ. He will talk about uh, national or, uh, urban mobility planning. So if a country has heard the signals you were giving and wants to get on the move, how could this be done? And there is an instrument which has been successfully put into practice already, and we will hear from Michael more about it. Michael Engelskirchen, please. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll start with you, okay. and then... Can yeah. you get up? Okay. Um, National Urban Mobility Plans, uh, it's an... I mean, it's an instrument uh, that should support or will shall support uh, uh, countries in developing an enabling framework for urban mobility. Um, it's it's not like a strict concept, so it's more like a guidance on the process um, that takes into account many or has many much flexibility taking account of local conditions. Um, this is well, actually, it's a definition of the NUMP, but uh, I mean, I don't want to bore you with definitions, but still highlight some, some key points uh, of a national urban mobility policy or program. So the first one uh, is it's a paradigm shift. So it, it has really an, uh, I mean, if not disruptive, but a, a transformative character. Um, so introducing new elements in the, in the current urban mobility policies. And uh, at the end, uh, the well, like final product should be a strategic action-oriented framework for uh, mobility uh, in the country. Um, it could uh, come with different focus, different uh, shape. I mean, like providing guidance and incentives for mobility transition, address only s specific segments uh, of the urban mobility, uh, uh, of urban mobility. Uh, and also provide a, a financing framework uh, for urban mobility. Again, could be for the whole sector or for specific elements. Important is always that it has to or should build an existing policy, so not being isolated, being integrative, uh, also looking at other sectors, so energy, urban development are sectors we are usually looking at when developing national urban mobility policies. Um, and another aspect in the last line, I mean participation, uh, this is a crucial element for us, so having a a large, wide um, participation process uh, include um, well, as many stakeholders as, as necessary. Um, I mean, this takes time, uh, but in the end, it really helps us uh, a smooth implementation uh, of the uh, of mobility policy. Uh, and also, I mean, it helps, uh, helps us to mitigate the risk of any uh, changes, political changes, uh, to, to continue with the, with the program. 
here just some of uh, our key elements. I mean, I mentioned several already. So uh, important is that we have a common agreement on, on a vision on, on the targets of the, the policy. So the, the uh, um, yeah, definition, what will we uh, do we want to achieve? Uh, and also this uh, across sectors. So not only talking to the transport ministry, but involving uh, energy, urban planning, uh, involving finance is also very important. Um, then we are looking at cooperation between institutions, so academia plays a role, so um, I mean at the same time while we de develop the plan we should look at how to build the capacity for the implementation of the, pla of the plan later on. Um, participation, I spoke about that, uh, and then also this coordination connection with the with financing. Uh, in order to avoid that it's well, just another plan in the, in the bookshelf, the, so really action-oriented, uh, concrete uh, proposals, uh, how the, the, the activities, the actions, the measures in the end will be implemented. And last but not least, um, it should also contribute to, to other strategies and policies in the country. I mean, highlighting here the, the NDC, uh, so that's why we bring together the, the NUMPs, uh, the National Mobility Policies, with the NDC in, in this side event. There are different types of, of uh, well, NUMPs, how we call the National Mobility Programs. Um, we have the, the policy and the program, these are like the, yeah, the um, ideal types of, uh, of NUMPs. Um, so policy is, uh, could be either like a sector strategy, so uh, overall transport uh, or mobility policy or mobility strategy for the country, or as well looking at specific sectors. Uh, so uh, policy for, uh, I don't know, new mobility modes for micro-mobility or for immobility. Um, on the other hand, we, we're looking at programs. Uh, this is often a well, support or investment program. Uh, so, I mean, we often comes with uh, with financing, so uh, financing framework for uh, mobility, um, and mostly focusing on, on specific elements. So I mean, we will hear later from uh, Paula about the the NUMP in, in Uruguay, which is a good example for a funding program to provide electric mobility uh, in in Uruguay. Um, well, but often, uh, as also in, in other cases, it's n not always black or white, so there are a lot of mixes. So, I mean, in the end, I would say each program also has a policy element. I mean, otherwise, uh, we will not have this transformational character. Um, so, in Chile, for example, in the region, we are, we are looking at a, a mix of policy and program uh, in the NUMP we are supporting uh, with Euroclimber Plus. Um, we often ask, um, what has a national level uh, the transport ministry to do with urban mobility? Uh, I mean, it is true, uh, the competence for urban mobility is, is on the local level, and I mean, they know a lot of, about urban mobility, um, but um, they need some support from the national level. Um, in particular, highlighting here uh, the, the shaping of a, of a funding um, instrument for urban mobility, so I mean, no city uh, can implement large-scale infrastructure project or mobility project without support from the national government, but also to, to create an enabling environment uh, with policies, regulations, uh, and uh, also incentives uh, to invest in sustainable urban mobility. Um, so, and, and also, I mean, like the harmonization of, of planning standards uh, and uh, also harmonization of standards on well, e-mobility, e for example, I mean, the, that we are using the same plugs in the whole country. I mean, there's a lot which uh, needs to be harmonized on, on the national level. Um, then, um, yeah, but uh, still, the, the main competence lays on the local level, so they are developing the sustainable mobility plan, so the, the guidance, uh, the strategy for urban mobility in that city, and they are, in the end, also implementing all measures. So, uh, I mean, there must be a close link uh, with the local level when developing uh, uh, national or mobility programs. This is just, uh, just roughly the, the timeline uh, for the development of the, of the NUMP. Um, as I said, it's, it's not a, a strict methodology, more like a guidance, a process uh, to follow. Because, I mean, each country is different. The, the, uh, the environment, the preconditions are different. Uh, um, the, so 
we we have to adapt and we we will adapt so but important or what we always follow more or less is these steps uh, having an initiation phase where we put together a group, put together the group of stakeholders working uh, on this topic, uh, then followed by an, an analysis phase uh, where we look into the, the current situation in the country, looking at policies, looking at funding streams, uh, but also looking at um, what well, good examples in the country that should, could be replicated. Um, and then in the next phase, we, we get in, I mean, in the core, so really discuss the, the strategy, the vision of the, of the program uh, together with the, the, with the stakeholder group, um, work on different uh, actions, measures that, that could be implemented. And then finally, select uh, a set of, of measures that, that are part of the, the national mobility policy. And then the, the last phase, which usually takes quite long, uh, a year or could be more, uh, the in-depth uh, elaboration of, uh, of the measures, uh, so working on, on cost, uh, working on, uh, on enabling frameworks, we need to do that, uh, working on, uh, as well also on the, on the benefits of each of the measures uh, and how to implement it. So that it's really getting, I mean, detailed and at the same, in the same phase we are already looking at funding uh, so to, to link each of the measures with a, with a funding source uh, and in order to really provide this, uh, I mean, uh, ready to to be implemented action plan, uh, which is, I mean, not not yet entails bankable projects, but uh, I mean, hopefully, projects that will be picked up by by finances, being it private sector, public sector, international banks. So, uh, but yeah, make them attractive and uh, help us uh, uh, as much as possible the government that that we have an implemental plan in the end. Um, just quickly running through two examples from, from Latin America. Uh, there's one NUMP policy um, uh, in, in Brazil, uh, which is uh, basically providing the framework for the establishment of sustainable mobility plans in the country. So saying that all bigger cities have to um, implement these sustainable mobility plans. At the same time, it, it supports the city in promoting sustainable uh, transport modes. And, and also uh, encourage the, the participation uh, of, the, of the population of the local level uh, in, the, in the implementation. So final product here is the urban mobility law. Um, so there's no, I mean, or no big funding compon component in that, but it provides a framework uh, for uh, sustainable mobility uh, actions. And then we have another example from Mexico, which is a, well, a funding frame, funding program. Um, so this is looking at the support to, to large-scale infrastructure measures, um, supporting on, on bus corridors uh, or mass transit in, in general, um, infrastructure, rolling stock support, and, and providing the, the financial assistance uh, to do so. To wrap up some lessons learned we have from the, the NUMPs we have implemented so far. So it, they do, in fact, generate a policy change uh, and facilitate investments. Uh, also, at the same time, they leverage private investments, uh, which is, I mean, international finance cannot solve the problem. So we need private and domestic funding. So therefore, it's really important to, to consider that. And it helps to the, uh, also the transformation um, in the sector, so in, because we include that capacity development component, include other co-benefits linked to mobility. And um, yeah, also, um, one lesson learned is emerging economies can finance the transition. So, I mean, there's really funding is available. Uh, it's just the, the structure we provide with the, with the NUMS to, to do that. And yeah, finally, NUMS indeed help to, to implement NDCs. Um, they help the, the sector transformation and, uh, and the participatory process uh, really helps to, to encourage, to foster the, the policy change. But at the same time as well, um, uh, the NDC link helps to implement the, the NUMS uh, because then we have a certain pressure yeah, uh, from, from the cabinet. So um, they have a commitment uh, to uh, invest in sustainable mobility and uh, that really helps them a lot to, to get that implemented. Thank you very much. Uh, can I, excuse me, can you get me? Okay. Uh, Andrea has come already. Uh, is it fine if we...
get you at the end on, on the panel and or would you rather prefer to give your setting the scene now at the beginning what what at the panel perfect good thanks a lot then we would come now to uh, Sasang Vermuri um, overview about available resources everything costs a lot of money and you tell us now did you bring the money already or at least you will tell us where to get it from <laughs> We are very much looking forward because without money, nothing is working. Thank you very Sasan. much. Um, I hopefully we'll be talking about more than just money uh, because we need more than just money. But um, I think uh, well, I can start the presentation already. So uh, thank you, Andreas. Uh, my name is Sasang Femuri. I am the coordinator for the Mobilizer City Partnership. Um, and I will just do two things very quickly in my five minutes, maybe I'll go into six minutes, is introduce the Mobilizer City Partnership and then talk about how the partnership helps raise ambition and links uh, the NUMPs again to the, the NDCs. So the, Mo oh, sorry. the Mobilizer City Partnership was established really uh, at COP in Paris, and so it's really working at this intersection of transport and climate change. Um, and you can see, we heard that 70% of the NDCs have a recognition that transport plays a role, but only six have a quantification. And so this is the kind of partnership that's required to elevate the issue of transport in the climate debate. And so this is sort of the origin story of Mobilize Your City. Our goal is to work in 100 cities in 20 countries. And um, we do that by supporting the development of the plans that Michelle mentioned, the National Urban Mobility Plans, but also at the city level, sustainable urban mobility plans of the cities, and then supporting with capacity development and linking to finance. Um, we're financially supported by the European Commission, but also the French and German environment ministries and have lots of implementation partners, primarily the AFD and the GIZ, uh, but also Quota 2 and, and others. And at the moment, we have uh, 61 partner cities all across the globe and 13 partner countries, eight of which we're supporting with these NUMPs. Um, so we have 50 million in technical assistance about, and the three NUMPs that we have finished, the plans that we have finished, have already mobilized 400 and, uh, or sorry, 369 million in implementation resources for urban mobility. Um, so I'll come back to why I think that's really important. So you can see it's sort of a, a really global partnership and it's, and it's across the world. And how does Mobilize Your City, these numps and sums again, link to the NDCs? Um, I think there's really three things that we do as a partnership that's really important. So one is to also help make transport ministries feel like climate champion. So it's not just sort of in the space of the environment ministries, but they also feel really connected to the issue of transport and see what they're doing is not just delivering, just delivering urban mobility services to the citizens, but also contributing to this global agenda. I think that's really important. And the first phase that Michelle mentioned uh, about the mobilized days, we bring also the environment ministries to the transport NUMP process. And so you kind of are facilitating a dialogue, which then helps ideally feed back into the NDC quantification. The second is, um, you know, again, going back to the first presentation, if 70% of NDCs have uh, identified transport as an issue, why are there so few that have a target? And I'm, our assumption is it's because they don't have the data to be able to quantify in a way that they feels achievable, no? Like, what should that target be? And uh, so we really work with identifying ways to quantify that, work at the city level uh, to see at various size cities, various uh, cities across the country, what kind of real mitigation targets are achievable and that can be aggregated at the country level. And ideally through that process, we have a quantification also of the NDCs. And then the last reason, um, we think that this is really a successful link between NUMPS and uh, the NDCs is this linking to finance. I think. Um, countries feel more likely to include it if they feel that there's a sort of link that happens with the finance. So we have um, the, I think, only 3% of climate finance goes to transport, although it accounts for anything from 18 to 25, 30% of emissions, depending on where you are. And so we clearly need better advocates, we need better information, and making the link between the NUMPs, uh, transport plans, and, uh, and NDCs, I think is a really good way that we work on helping uh, cities or countries um, quantify their goals, be more ambitious about their NDCs. So finally, if anybody is sort of interested in this, um, come speak to me, my colleagues. Uh, we'd be more than happy to, to work with you on kind of helping quantify the goals and linking the NUMPs to NDCs. Thank you. I think that was great. 
I yesterday morning joined a side event which started with five TED Talks and everyone had three minutes. And this was already very close to this three minutes, so this was great, congratulations. Uh, and you have to bring the ministries on board and that's what we are trying now. Paula Visca, welcome here. Uh, you are from the Ministry of Housing, Territorial Planning and Environment, Uruguay. Sasang has just said we have to make the ministries, he said he talked about the Ministry of Transport, but all ministries climate champion. Are you already a climate champion? I hope so. <laughs> okay. Very much looking forward to listening to you. Thank you. Bueno, buenas tardes a todas y todos. Eh, es mi oportunidad para hablar en español en esta presentación, ya que estamos en una COP de América Latina y en España también. Eh, Así que, bueno, muchas gracias eh, a GIZ, a Slowcat y a Euroclima por, por la invitación para contar. Eh, también trataré de no, no extenderme demasiado en cuál es nuestra experiencia, nuestro proceso en Uruguay eh, hacia una movilidad más sostenible y también en el marco de nuestro proyecto con Euro, que Euroclima Plus en el, en el NUMP. Necesito... El, perdón. Gracias. Bueno, antes de entrar eh, en, el, en, en el proyecto en sí, quería eh, mostrar, eh, me parecía importante señalar el marco de iniciativas y políticas que tenemos en nuestro país, porque la movilidad eh, sostenible, la movilidad en general es un tema muy transversal y necesita que distintos organismos, distintas políticas, distintos elementos confluyan y se alineen en una, en una dirección. Y para nosotros es muy importante entonces este, contar o, o mostrar que, que venimos haciendo eh, distintas, desde distintos sectores, tenemos distintas iniciativas desde hace ya algunas más de una década, como es la política energética 2005-2030, que permitió descarbonizar nuestra matriz eléctrica y ya desde hace unos años tenemos 98% de energía renovable en la matriz eléctrica. Eh, luego tenemos una política nacional de cambio climático con un horizonte 2050, un plan nacional ambiental del año pasado, con, también con metas a 2030, una estrategia nacional de ciudades sostenibles, un proyecto GEF específicamente de movilidad sostenible. Eh, recientemente eh, tenemos una ley para el, para el subsidio a la compra de ómnibus eléctricos a operadores de todo el país, a operadores de, de transporte público de pasajeros. Eh, luego tenemos la empresa eléctrica, tiene una, está implementando una ruta eléctrica en nuestro país para que cada 60 kilómetros existan cargadores donde los vehículos eléctricos puedan eh, cargar. Eh, bueno, en Montevideo ya tenemos experiencias de movilidad eléctrica con ómnibus y con eh, taxis. Eh, ya hay más de 50 taxis en Montevideo. Bueno, también tenemos un proyecto, un plan de adaptación en ciudades que también tiene estos temas eh, transversales. Y eh, tenemos un proyecto regional Reines que acaba de ser aprobado y con el que, en el que Costa Rica también participa y otros países de, de América Latina. Además de todas estas políticas que vienen contribuyendo a, a, a una, eh, digamos, que dan el marco habilitante y también contribuyen para que podamos eh, dirigirnos hacia una movilidad más sostenible en Uruguay, eh, lo que les comentaba, tenemos estas condiciones que habilitantes, sobre todo energéticas, que dan la oportunidad de poder eh, avanzar en la electromovilidad en particular dentro de esa movilidad sostenible a la que nosotros queremos llegar. Eh, además de la matriz eléctrica que les mencionaba, el total de la matriz de Uruguay energética eh, tiene más de un 60% de energía renovable. Eh, tenemos eh, energía renovable en la noche derivada de la, de la importante capacidad instalada en, en, en eh, energía eólica que permite justamente que, eh, que las, las, el transporte eléctrico a baterías pueda recargar por la noche a un precio muy, muy competitivo porque al tener oferta abundante, los precios de la electricidad son muy, mucho más bajos en la noche y entonces 
eso habilitaría que muchos más vehículos de los que ya tenemos puedan, este, sin necesidad de estresar la matriz energética o eléctrica, este, puedan seguir eh, aumentando es, esos vehículos. Y entonces, eh, respecto a la matriz de emisiones de gases de efecto invernadero en Uruguay, el transporte es el principal emisor de CO2 eh, y nada menos que el 64% refieren a, vienen de ese sector. Quiere decir que nosotros tenemos la oportunidad, pero también la, la necesidad de avanzar en, en descarbonizar este sector, así como avanzamos descarbonizando la matriz eléctrica, porque realmente es casi que el, el único lugar donde estamos eh, emitiendo CO2 eh, o el más importante en, en nuestro país. Bueno, acá quería, volviendo un poco a la... A la eh, se relaciona esta, esta transparencia con la, con la primera, que mmm, donde hay hitos más específicos, tal vez, que en, en, específicamente en movilidad. Los otros, las otras cuestiones que yo mencionaba eran más de políticas y, y otros planes que, que contribuyen, pero, pero acá hay cuestiones más específicas como de promoción de vehículos eléctricos desde el tema impositivo, eh, también los gobiernos departamentales hace unos años que el permiso de circulación lo han este, eh, eh, es gratis para, para vehículos eléctricos, por ahora cada año revisan si mantienen o no esa decisión, eh, pero lo que tratan de hacer esas medidas como, como exoneraciones de eh, importación, etcétera es tratar de nivelar un poco los precios más... Eh, más altos de, que por ahora tienen los vehículos eléctricos para que sean competitivos de, de la movilidad de, de los vehículos tradicionales. Bueno, ahí hay, en 2014 se estableció un grupo interinstitucional de eficiencia energética en transporte. Esto lo quiero mencionar porque es un grupo técnico compuesto por esos cuatro ministerios que están eh, debajo de mis diapositivas, son el, el Ministerio de Industria, el de Ambiente, el de Transporte y el de Economía y Finanzas. Estos cuatro ministerios forman parte de ese grupo, al igual que la empresa eléctrica, la empresa petrolera, y eh, bueno, que refina, porque en Uruguay no tenemos petróleo, y eh, también la Intendencia, el Gobierno Departamental de, de la capital del país de Montevideo. Entonces, ese grupo se junta una vez por mes desde hace cinco años. Y todas esas cuestiones de estos este, incentivos, eh, etcétera, surgieron de ese grupo de trabajo técnico que luego eleva a los distintos ministerios con las distintas competencias las, las, las propuestas de decisión para que las políticas eh, sean coherentes y se puedan alinear y no queden incentivos contradictorios a, ante, ante, ante el, el, el consumidor que no entienda por dónde por dónde tiene que, o sea, para dónde está la línea de política del país. Eh, bueno, ahí hay otras cuestiones como el subsidio ómnibus que mencioné hoy, que es una ley, ahí está la primera NDC, la ruta eléctrica que empezó a, 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 a implementarse desde 2017 y otras cuestiones que no me puedo detener. Bueno, yendo al proyecto NUM, que es este, el que nos apoya Euroclima y forma parte, contribuye a todo este paquete de de políticas, como decía Mijael, estos proyectos no son cuestiones aisladas, sino que se tienen que anclar en, en, en otros procesos que los países realizan, porque si no, obviamente no van a poder tener un resultado eh, eficaz. Entonces, eh, en el caso de Uruguay, si bien tenemos un componente de electromovilidad, que como ya comenté antes, es, es bastante evidente que hay que aprovechar esa oportunidad que nosotros tenemos, eh, Digamos, es, es, eh, en Uruguay también existe la... O sea, nosotros llegaríamos a un programa o tal vez hasta a una política de movilidad urbana sostenible nacional, pero también como comentaron antes, eh, eh, la movilidad urbana es un tema local, o sea, los departamentos o provincias, en, depende en cada país, son quienes tienen la autoridad o competencia sobre eso, entonces no... Eh, no, no hay una injerencia directa del gobierno nacional. Entonces, si bien estamos trabajando en esa política a nivel de gobierno nacional, también estamos trabajando muy fuerte con los gobiernos de los departamentos. Tenemos cinco departamentos de los 19 que hay en Uruguay que están trabajando directamente en el proyecto como pilotos, digamos, 
y hemos realizado talleres sobre movilidad sostenible en esas en ciudades de esos departamentos eh, porque ellos mismos se, se presentaron a un llamado que hicimos para comenzar ese diálogo más directo entre gobierno nacional y gobierno departamental. Esos talleres fueron muy, muy enriquecedores, eh, ya hicimos dos en cada una de las ciudades eh, y eso eh, digamos, va a dar insumos para que las ciudades puedan tener en el marco de la política de movilidad sostenible sus propios planes de movilidad urbana sostenible en las ciudades. También el proyecto tiene un componente de, eh, de fortalecimiento de capacidades que pretendemos tanto eh, realizarlo con las ciudades como con... Eh, a nivel del sistema educativo formal, porque nos hemos dado cuenta que la movilidad en Uruguay a nivel académico se, digamos, se ubica en, distintos, en distintas universidades, abordan distintos temas, pero no es tan fácil hacer el cruce multidisciplinario que esto tiene y sería muy interesante que quienes hacen investigan en infraestructura eh, conversaran con los quienes investigan los temas sociales y de género o quienes hacen las las eh, no sé las eh, temas tecnológicos para la movilidad eh, o bueno no sé los distintos los distintos este, quienes están en ordenamiento territorial y ven los distintos aspectos y bueno eh, también tenemos unas guías que refieren como producto del proyecto a planificación de la movilidad que abarca esos temas más globales y gracias y a electromovilidad en particular Ah, y mecanismos financieros también como eh, opciones que luego se puedan utilizar también para, para promover la movilidad sostenible, tanto desde incentivos del Estado como también modelo de negocio para privados, etc. Eh, bueno, tratando de, o mostrándole lo que nuestra NDC, que fue mencionada en, por algunos de los eh, presentadores anteriores, nosotros sí tenemos eh, metas cuantificadas, de, somos de los pocos que tenemos cuantificados los... Ahí no puse todo lo, no puse justamente los números, pero se puede ver en la NDC de Uruguay eh, que hay eh, metas cuantificadas para las, para, las, para las acciones de mitigación en transporte. Están especificadas así como, como, como yo las transmití allí. Eh, y estas son sin medios de implementación adicionales. O sea, nosotros ya tenemos una ley de biocombustibles para en la mezcla de combustibles fósiles. Eh, estamos trabajando en el etiquetado obligatorio de vehículos a combustión. Y luego tenemos unas metas de introducción de vehículos utilitarios y de transporte público que, es, si de contar con más apoyo, obviamente son más ambiciosas. Nosotros tenemos una sección después, si tuviéramos apoyo cómo podríamos aumentar la ambición en este tipo de medidas. De la ruta eléctrica les, les comenté recién, la idea es que todo el país tenga eh, hasta ahora eh, parte de la costa, la parte turística del país tiene cargadores cada no 60 kilómetros, pero la idea es este, extender la ruta eléctrica a todo el país. Y bueno, sobre algunas cuestiones eh, finales, tal vez ya comenté alguna de ellas, eh, creo que es importante, como desde nuestra experiencia, al menos el marco de políticas y el trabajo interinstitucional que hemos realizado hasta ahora, eh, el involucramiento del sector privado eh, y otros actores relevantes para que estas políticas tengan éxito. Tal vez me tomo un minuto o 30 segundos para comentar el, el subsidio que implica, como les decía, que el Estado da un subsidio para que pueda, los operadores inviertan en ómnibus eléctricos. Eh, la buena noticia para el Ministerio de Economía es que eso no implica un gasto nuevo para el Estado porque por razones sociales eh, el transporte público ya tiene un subsidio entonces lo que es, y además se paga por combustible consumido. Entonces en este caso lo que sucede es que se, se sustituye el, el subsidio que se da por consumo de gasoil a la inversión en, en un transporte más limpio, de mejor calidad, y entonces eh, para el Estado es más o menos es la misma cantidad de dinero, pero eh, está me, mucho mejor gastada en, en nuestra visión. Eh, y bueno, lo que les decía, los gobiernos locales es fundamental que participen y esperamos poder lograr con éxito nuestra NDC a 2025. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Paula.
Aparentemente viene de un país que está en movimiento en cuanto al transporte. Felicitaciones. Okay, so now we come to our panel discussion and now I would be very glad to see Andrea Mesa uh, here in the front. I would uh, very much like to invite Ramon Cruz from Mexico, uh, Mexico International Policy Program Director from IDTP. Hi. Um, hello. hello. And uh, Juan Carlos Muñoz from the Pontifica Catholic uh, University of Santiago de Chile. How unfortunate that we are not in your country. Yes. But good that you could come here. Uh, maybe I... S okay. Welcome. Um, I would like to ask first, Andrea, you have heard now something which sounded pretty good. We have heard about many plans. We heard a lot about instruments which are available. We heard about countries on the move. So it sounds as it's time to relax. Um, we are we are on our way, and everything will be fine. Is, that's something which I heard, and would be. I mean, Costa Rica is also very much advanced. Are you already relaxed or still a bit tense, <laughs> as far as our ambition is concerned? Okay, is this working? Is it working? Yeah, now it's working. Okay, Thank great. You. Um, I'm very concerned <laughs> in terms of emissions um, and particularly the ones that comes from the transport sector. In, in our case, this is our challenge, not to say our nightmare. <laughs> and, um, but uh, as you were mentioning and saying, uh, we're also very hopeful because I think that one lesson that we are seeing in the region and, and linking this uh, to the first NDCs that we presented is that now we have more information in one hand, more data, more clarity of what this NDC should look like. And also in the case of Costa Rica, we have our long-term strategy, which is called decarbonization plan. And these give us a um, more comprehensive view uh, at the national level. It has, it's a more integrated and, and harmonized vision of how to transform the cities, the economy, the different sectors to achieve the decarbonization target or to be carbon neutral at 2050, which is, which is the goal. So basically, yes, we're concerned. But in the other hand, now I think we have more or better instruments. This long-term plan is one of these instruments. And of course, uh, with a specific uh, targets for the transport sector and, and in our case for, for sustainable mobility elements, for freight as well, and, and for public transport and, and light vehicles fleets. So I think that with these elements, we know that the, the, the transformational change is huge and it will require a lot of alignment, a lot of financial resources, but at least it's a very first good step and it's, I think it's a, it will allow us to improve the quality of our NDC and we are committed to present our enhanced NDC in 2020. Thank you so much, um, Andrea. Ramon, how relaxed are you? No way. How relaxed, How relaxed are you with um, regard to what you have heard already? <laughs> well, I, 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 I like to relax. Boys, <laughs> Except I'm not really. <laughs> I'm actually uh, from the other Rican uh, country. I'm, I'm, I'm actually originally from Puerto Rico. Okay. But ITDP has, um, has an office in, uh, in Mexico. Uh, so I'm, I'm the International Policy Program Director for ITDP, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. Um, now, um, in terms of um, you know, how relaxed uh, we can be, I, I hope nobody comes out of this uh, 
of this COP very relaxed because uh, definitely the level of ambition, uh, not only in the transport sector, but in general needs to be increased uh, urgently. Uh, in terms of the uh, transport NDCs and in the region, I think if we can uh, invest in cloning technology, we can start cloning uh, Uruguay's uh, uh, transport NDC throughout the region and then we would be actually in a very good uh, way. Now, uh, if we're not going to invest in cloning technology, uh, we should at least uh, study that. Uh, and I would definitely say that you know, to the audience and the different countries, uh, that is actually a, a, a good way of uh, looking uh, into NDCs and include everything from planning uh, at the national level, at the municipal level. Uh, and sometimes in other countries, this is happening. Uh, already. It's just for some reason, maybe the ministries of transport or the different uh, cities are actually not in communication with the national focal points uh, in charge of developing the NDCs. So actually one uh, low-hanging fruit is start that communication so that some of that planning goes there and increase that, uh, uh, refine those NDCs. But certainly, I mean, the, the mix of uh, investing more in the, in the avoid and shift part, so avoiding unnecessary travel, um, uh, dealing with the, with the management of, of, uh, of demand is important, uh, but also then shifting to cleaner modes. ITDP today is actually releasing a report on uh, electric micromobility. So it's a lot of the scooters dealing with that first and last mile. It's very important, you know, that's the reason many people don't take public transport is because, well, how do I get from my home to uh, and, and my, my uh, work to the public transport? And we're seeing that many of these are, are solutions that are already available in many cities and that should be promoted. So please, uh, you know, uh, go into itdp.org, look at that, uh, at that report that, uh, that we have today, uh, spread it uh, around, tweet about it, uh, but, uh, but yes, yeah, certainly include it as part of your avoid and shift strategies that uh, should be included in more NDCs. I'll stop there. And we can Thanks a lot. Um, Juan Carlos, you're more from the academia side. We have listened so far to politicians, to civil servants and to rather implementing organizations. Um, now you are approaching the situation more from the university uh, academia. Um, how do you react to what you have heard so far in our event this afternoon? Yeah, my, my perception, well, I'm Juan Carlos Muñoz from Catholic University and I've been in charge from the Ministry of Science in Chile to uh, lead a group of researchers working on how cities should be addressed in terms of uh, being, to, of contributing to climate change. And my, my perception is that very often we get too fast into the tools and we forget the big picture. Uh, I have the feeling that most of the, or, or my perception is that most of the NDCs fail to address cities as a whole. Uh, of course, electromobility is good. Of course, having great e-scooters is great. But if your job is still going to be 25 kilometers away from where you live, there's no way that cars won't be an option. And, uh, and I think that the issue of how cities are being planned, how cities are being governed, how many incentives we are giving to, uh, uh, to uh, city authorities to um, govern their cities in a way that, that we need compact cities and we, don't, we cannot let them grow uh, without control as we, used, as, we, as we see in Santiago, in Chile, a, a city, a country that has been, uh, it's committed to have, to reach carbon neutrality by 2050, is still building and building cities uh, in, in, in expansion as if that doesn't matter in terms of the final goal. And I think it's crucial. 
if, we st if, we, if we're going to have cities that are growing in the way Chilean cities are growing, there's no way we're going to be reaching the transportation goals uh, for carbon neutrality. And, and so, so the issue of uh, electromobility, I think, it needs to be understood as a tool, not as a goal. And I think that's a major problem of Chilean authorities, that we're trying to say, well, we need electromobility. And what we really need first is to have much more compact cities. Can you at least tell us one Latin American city who is moving into a good direction from which we can learn? I mean, we know all about not so good examples and we talk a lot about not so good examples. So please give us at least one line of hope at the end of the tunnel. I think that uh, in terms of cities that are doing the right thing, I think they are beyond Latin America. I mean, I went to Singapore. And Singapore, even though it's a pretty liberal country in many aspects, they have they are very strict about how the cities are governed, where you're going to be building your next buildings, which area are are going to be kept for parks, where are you going to be keeping getting your your water from in an island that has very little water. I'm not claiming that Singapore is ideal, but definitely there are elements of governing cities much more strictly than what we do in Latin America that we should be keeping and we should be uh, taking. I think in, in London we have ideas like this also where you're governing your, your, your city uh, not only uh, as a little comuna or a little area in the city but metropolitan. Uh, with all your transport modes in one hand, with all your sectors in one hand, and that's something that uh, you very rarely see in Latin America. I think that some Colombian cities are doing pretty good stuff. Uh, they have, they, we, we can, we, I can see that, uh, for instance, Medellin, that has amazing transport system, but I'm, I'm not familiarized on how they, how strong they govern the city in terms of driving them toward being compact on that people will have be able to solve their needs within five kilometers radius. I think that should be part of the part of the of the goal. Because if you ha can address and or solve your problems within five kilometers, then car is out of the question. It's not going to be the first, the best alternative for you to move. Walking would be great. Dry, uh, a bike will be very competitive with a car, and of course public transport would also provide a great alternative, and not necessarily a car. I think that that should be the first driving uh, request for, for authorities worldwide. Okay. Um, I had promised at the beginning that we will also bring you into the picture. Everyone who would like to say something has exactly 90 seconds to participate. Um, and so we collect first three or four uh, of your questions, statements, contributions, and then we would react. Who dares? 90 seconds? And please, a brief introduction who you are. Sure. Um, hi, good afternoon. My name is Pauline Leonard. I work in the uh, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean based in Santiago. And I work in the Division of Statistics, and um, one of the things we're working on is to see how um, cities are measuring uh, urban mobility. So, and what we've seen in five cities in Latin America, in Mexico City, Montevideo, Quito, Bogota, and one city in, um, in Chile that is not a capital city, is that um, actually the data is not comparable. It's very different over time and sometimes even in the same country uh, in different cities. So my question to the panelists was um, how do you think we can strengthen the measurement that are done by the cities and as the colleague from the ITPC yeah, did I say it? Okay. Um, how do you see this in terms of um, institutional coordination with uh, national statistical systems, for instance? Okay, thank you very much. 90 seconds. Yeah, we, we collect first about measurement and statistics. Who would like, please? Hi, uh, my name is Soledad Palma. I'm from the Ministry of Environment from Chile. Uh, I agree with Juan Carlos, of course. Uh, we need to work together with every sector. Uh, during our NDC process, during this year we did our uh, NDC updating process and we worked together with every ministers and it was very good we, because we could see that we need to uh, guarantee the implementation of the NDC and of course to improve the ambition. And therefore I want to ask uh, to colleagues from Costa Rica and Mexico 
about the work with uh, every sector. And also, I want to ask about social uh, benefits, because in our country, uh, transport is, is not only responsible for climate change, right? Black carbon is a very important issue, and now it's more important because uh, you know about our social and political situation. Therefore, is co-benefit is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next one. Please. Yes, good afternoon. My name is uh, Luis Villarreal. I led uh, ECO, which is a consultancy um, helping uh, countries developing their NDCs. Uh, one of the challenges we have in such tasks is how we implement NDCs and how we develop a list of projects that can be uh, ready to implement, right? And which are the funding uh, available. And one of the main tools we are looking at is the Green Climate Fund. And the main challenge for the Green Climate Fund is how we define a paradigm shift, right? Uh, so uh, the, the question is about ideas, your visions, about what represents a paradigm shift in uh, mobility in Latin America. Because I think we we are all hungry of ideas for paradigm shifts in across the countries. I'm sure you are happy to share ideas with everybody. Thank you. Okay, one more from this side. Yes, please. And then we go. Voy a hablar en español. Me disculpo por cualquier cosa. Mi nombre es Nicole Mesén. Soy de Costa Rica. Eh, yo quiero preguntarle a los panelistas. Bueno, de Costa Rica sí sé la respuesta, pero en el caso de Costa Rica. Si sí quisiera que Andrea comentara un poquito de la participación ciudadana en el proceso de, de transición al transporte eh, público eléctrico, pero eh, a los otros dos panelistas, ¿qué tanto han involucrado a la ciudadanía en, en ese proceso de transporte público? Eh, ¿Qué tanto participan en, en los procesos eh, y específicamente en, en grupos vulnerables? como es eh, los sectores como personas con discapacidad. Gracias. Okay, thank you very much. Who would like to start from you? Yes, Andrea. Um, and thank you for, for the questions. And, and first, I would like to congratulate the government of Chile because I think that under this uh, uh, com complex situation, you have been able to manage to sustain the COP, and I really thank you for that and for the support of the government of, of Madrid mm -hmm. uh, as well, yes. And and second, I I really think that the, um, what you were organizing, this idea of bringing the different sectorial ministries, and that was was, was the, the original plan, and having transport ministries um, calling and attending the COP was a really great idea, and I think that we will need to try to do it someday in the next COP because that that is a great idea, and it's the kind of elements that we need to have this comprehensive approach. And as I was saying, in our case, uh, the big challenge that we have to achieve the carbon neutrality goal is to change the way our cities <laughs> are planned, and I totally agree with what um, Juan Carlos mentioned. And I think that this element and, and putting land use planning, and again, uh, this element at this, as a central strategy of our decarbonization plan, and it is there as one of the, our main strategies, it is one of the elements. In our case, we having this uh, integrated approach includes bringing the Ministry of Transport, uh, because in our case, uh, competencies are at the national level with the Ministry of Transport, the transport uh, matters, but then for land use planning, we need to include local governments. So these elements of, of bringing this vertical, vertical integration and this um, um, horizontal um, integration is critical. In our decarbonization plan is what we have, uh, what we have done in the first three axes of our plan. It's basically these elements of including um, this comprehensive approach. And we have a specific targets for how are we going to be changing the way our cities are planned and built. Uh, how do we improve public transport as a, as a critical element? And if you go to San Jose, you will discover that we're very far from that. 
And for example, we don't even have good sidewalks, <laughs> which is like a very first element that you need when you want to have a, a nice city. And, and in this element, why are we were doing this and, and linking this with the need of having a long-term vision, having uh, these elements of transforming cities, you will not achieve this in a five-year period. You need a long-term vision to have this. And that's why my other reflection, the importance again and the opportunity that we have uh, as, as countries of having our long-term plans, but we really need to understand that this is not an environmental issue. This is not an environmental issue. It's, having a, it's a development issue. And the opportunity then, and why are we doing this? And in our case, why our president is so committed to this agenda? It's because he's very clear that this is the opportunity that the country have to improve the quality of life. If you ask a Costa Rican citizen right now what's uh, one of his biggest um, nightmares, he will say traffic jams. Some people, they spend like two or three hours trying to get to their, to their jobs and going backwards to their, to their homes. So it's, it's really becoming a, a big element and we're losing competitiveness of our cities, of losing and wasting a lot of money mm -hmm. in this. And we are also doing an economic cost-benefit analysis of all this in terms of air quality, in terms of traffic accidents, and all these elements are showing us why this is good for the economy, why this is good to improve health indicators, and why this is good for improving quality of life. And this is okay. becoming also because the request of the citizens. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Juan Carlos first and then Ramon. So I would like to go with the paradigm shift. I think it's a great uh, challenge and I have some some of my favorite ideas. Uh, number one is uh, based on the issue that COP is in Madrid. Uh, COP is in Madrid and not in Santiago because of a five cent increment on the fare of public transport. Uh, and this five cent uh, increment ma made people uh, uh, make a big unrest. People end up evading the public transport putting fire into the, into the metro stations and the buses. And we've been in seven weeks just because of five cent increment on the fare. We came to the COP and we all receive a free public transport car. We all. We are not the poorest in the city, still we get this. And I think that this, we give this to people in the conference because we think that it's great for us to come to the COP by bus or by metro and not by car. And the, uh, the, co the conference considered that this is a great for the city. I wonder why we cannot do this for the city we live on, where poor people could get a car like this that is paid by the business where they work, by the richest houses in the city where they live. Why can't we treat public transport the same way we treat garbage collection? We don't pay, gar pay garbage collection by bag. Yeah, it would be very eco economically efficient. But it's so complicated. People would, would end up burning the bags of garbage. People would be sending the garbage to, this, to, this, to the rivers. People would be, and the, the trash would be much more effective because they would have to stop everywhere to collect the bags and charge you for the, for the bags. So we decide not to do that and we pay a fixed amount per house. Why can't we do the same thing with public transport? Pay public transport as a system, as a city. The same way that probably any business would pay each of their employees to move from one place to another because they're working for the business. Why can't we treat people in the city as part of the, what the city provides? I think that's a very interesting uh, uh, di disruptive paradigm. But there's many. I mean, we can think of uh, our streets instead of being in, in, in during the rush hour, instead of putting all the lines for cars, why don't we do them a, a set of access only for buses and bikes? Imagine a, a, a city that during the peak hour, 7.30 to 9.30, all the, not all the streets, but maybe the most Im important uh, uh, streets are only for bikes and, and, and buses. I think that would make the idea that the city is governed for people that would prefer sustainable transport. I think cities should have city limits. That's something that in, in Latin America is very uncommon. City limits, where you cannot keep growing and growing uh, your city because it becomes much more unsustainable. I think we should have tax exemption for people that put their business in areas that are close or nearby low-income people. It would be great if you can have business right there so people don't have to travel two hours to get to their, to, to, to their, 
to, to their work. I think we should have something that in, in, in many cities is very common, metropolitan authorities. And that's something that we, in Chile we're, we're going to have, but we're very reluctant of giving them the right uh, attribution so that they can really govern the city. And finally, I think we should measure the CO2 emissions of every city and give the authorities a target on how they should be reducing. Like, you have 10, if, if we're going to be carbon neutral by 2050, what will Concepcion do? What will Valparaíso do? What will Santiago do? What are their targets in terms of, and, and I think we should give them also some incentives on reducing, for instance, the average distance traveled. If the average distance traveled, they have to reduce them, and that's why by law to receive some, uh, some fina finance for the city. If they have to reduce it, then of course public transport will be great. Of course, walking and cycling will be great. And I think we should be much more active in terms of uh, 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 addressing the car. The car is not only a problem of, of carbon emission, it's also an issue of sedentarism, congestion, uh, accidents, and so on and so forth. I'm sure you didn't expect so many paradigm shifts, did you? When you asked this question, it was really amazing. Thanks a lot, Ramon. Exactly, yeah, definitely. I, I will not address the paradigm shift since you already heard from the expert. Uh, but um, I will address, uh, well, the, the question that, that um, uh, the Economic Commission uh, for Latin America asked about uh, statistics. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a, a big, uh, um, a big obstacle uh, in planning in general, not only in the region, but in the world. Uh, we have, uh, for example, we're seeing it with the SDGs. And, you know, it's something that the Millennium Development Goals were actually successful in many places was because it, it kind of provided a, a series of indicators where countries started measuring all together, no? And with the SDGs, we're trying to, to do the same, no? In, in our case, we worked uh, a lot with the 11.2 uh, that deals with um, transport, air quality in the cities, uh, communities, and uh, we, uh, for example, uh, contributed with, uh, with the people near transit indicator, trying to measure people within one kilometer of uh, rapid transit. Uh, what, what we're seeing is countries have not reported uh, many countries, uh, we hope that will change in the next decade. But yeah, I mean, if you don't measure it, you cannot intervene. You don't know where exactly, wh who's falling behind. And what we hope is that uh, we'll do that. Uh, but uh, having said that, there are different efforts. In the region, for example, CAF, uh, um, the Development Bank for Latin America, uh, did uh, an, uh, has an observatory for uh, indicators uh, on sustainable transport. Uh, there has been different communities of practice. There's uh, actually part of the Transport Decarbonization Alliance there are different communities of transit, one focusing more on uh, data, uh, uh, indicators, etc. cetera, uh, that, uh, that it's, it's important. So when you, please, you have different countries represented here, it's important that they join these different platforms to start then uh, measuring that. But of course, it's very technical work. So, uh, so it is technical, um, you know, um, uh, officials, etc., that needs to bring up uh, that in the different countries. Uh, now, in terms of the question uh, for inclusiveness, uh, and especially the most vulnerable uh, populations, um, something that, uh, at least in the transport sector, that we focus a lot is not only dealing with climate change. It's, uh, and if you ask a mayor of a city, probably they won't, uh, their priorities won't be climate change. Uh, their priorities is usually uh, quality of life, is criminality, has to do with congestion, has to do with air quality, etc. So, but what we have seen is that if you plan a city for the most vulnerable populations, um, uh, personas con discapacidad, no? uh, children, uh, senior citizens, you usually then plan also for to deal with congestion, to deal with road safety, and you plan also for climate change. So, uh, so it is a comprehensive appro approach that uh, that we need uh, in the different cities, and therefore in also the national mobility plans and the national platform to then have actually what we're all talking about in this conference. But that has to do also with quality of life, reducing congestion, etc. 
uh, and actually for the World Urban Forum, ITDP will uh, it's uh, writing a, a paper uh, on access for all, uh, and actually with uh, with the World Enabled uh, Network on uh, um, people with disabilities and access and transport. So thank you very much. I was informed that the next event starts already sharp at 5:30, so. One brief sentence from each three of you, what still gives you hope? But only one sentence. What gives you hope? What is, my hope? What is your hope? <laughs> Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> Seems to be very difficult, this question. <laughs> and we have one minute. One minute each. One hope minute. Yeah. Andrea. Um, have cities for people and not for cars. Okay. Um, I would then stick to uh, something not as inspirational, but uh, measure everything, uh, and uh, so so that we can have good data. Yeah, young people complaining. Sorry. Young people complaining. Young people complaining. Yes. That gives me hope. Elderly may also be allowed to. Elderly people also? Okay, let me thank everyone here in the room, all those who have given very good inputs, the three on the panel and the very active participation. It's one of the most difficult issues we are dealing with, uh, but I think there are also a lot of new approaches. In Germany we say politics, only start getting active when the child is hanging inside the well only with one finger and is threatened to fall down. So usually politics only get going in the last minute when the danger is increasing. And I think the danger is increasing. Let's hope for the young, young generation. Let's hope for all of us that mankind somehow still will get going and will improve things. And with this, I wish you a wonderful evening. Thanks a lot to everyone. And still enjoy being here. Thanks a lot.